AI is going to be like electricity or like the steam engine or like computers, meaning the kinds of technology that changed the world forever, that changed humanity forever. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with The Ripple Effect. Well, we know there's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, uh, especially in the uh, immediacy, uh, Kartik. And this is something that you have written about and talked about a lot. What was it that kind of got your juices flowing and interest you about artificial intelligence in the first place? Well, you know, my undergraduate degree was in electronics and, and there was a master's in computer science. So I'd studied computer programming, but this was back in the nineties at a time when AI wasn't what it is today. And in fact, AI had mostly failed to deliver on its early promise by then. So interest in AI was diminishing. We had very limited coursework in AI. And so that's the context in which I was first introduced to AI. But what really piqued my interest were actually a couple of things. When I was in grad school doing my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, I took a course from, you know, one of these geniuses of modern times. His name is Herb Simon. He is, I think, probably the only person I know who's won the highest award in economics, the Nobel Prize, and the highest award in computer science, the Turing Award, and the highest award in psychology. So he won all of these three and he was on campus and he was teaching a course and you just try and register for the course if you can. And I did without having any interest in the subject. And I remember when I was in that class and he would talk about these things, which are like a mix of, you know, psychology, how the human mind works, computer science, how can we take those ideas into uh, the world of AI and computers and then economics as well in terms of what this means for, for the world. You know, that was the first time I, my interest in this started to um, get peaked. Uh, nonetheless, my work still wasn't yet AI. Um, for the next few years, I was working on e-commerce, internet advertising and so on. And my first genuine interest in this topic came in when you know, you started to see like personalized recommendations on Amazon and Netflix um, and all these places. And a student of mine uh, brought up this question of, you know, what is it doing to the kinds of products we consume and kinds of media we consume and how is it changing it? And then I got really interested in this idea that algorithms are influencing decisions we make. And that was my first entry into this subject of algorithms broadly, but then within that AI as well. So I find it interesting because um, there's so much conversation going on right now about AI and how it's going to impact business. And realistically, AI and business are, are not new to each other. They've been connected for some time, but it feels like the conversation has taken a different level. How do you view that combination of business and AI and how those two will work in the future? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's really interesting if you look at AI and business, of course, AI is the big buzzword in business. And so I find it often in the business world gets divisive and a bit polarized in the sense that there are the believers who talk about, look, AI is going to be a game changer. And then there are people who feel like, oh, OK, this is the next NFT or the next, uh, I don't know, wearable computers or Google Glasses or whatever. Pick your example where there's a technology with a lot of hype that goes nowhere. So I'm going to make a big, bold claim here, which is that I think AI is going to be like electricity or like the steam engine or like computers, meaning the kinds of technology that changed the world forever, that changed humanity forever. There's the you know, human lives before electricity and there's human lives after electricity. It's going to be like that with AI. And this is not just a statement I'm making based on my gut feel, which by the way, there is gut feel in that statement, but it's based on real evidence. So 
people, eco economists and other researchers have studied these kinds of technologies that we refer to as general purpose technologies. These are technologies like electricity, computers that are different than other technologies in a few ways. One is that at a macro level, they stimulate a lot of innovation and a huge amount of economic growth. At a micro level, meaning individual firms, they end up changing winners and losers of individual markets because of how companies adopt the technology. Like take internet, for example. Well, the largest retailer is not Walmart, it's Amazon. Or Kmart, one of the largest retailers before the internet doesn't exist today. Things like that, right? It changes competitive dynamics fundamentally. And researchers have looked at what are the properties of technologies that go on to become general purpose technologies. And all the early data suggests that AI looks like a general purpose technology. If you look at hiring patterns related, uh, related to AI, if you look at uh, patent filings related to AI, you look at a number of other things. Um, in fact, there was a recent study by my colleague, Dan Rock, where he looked at specifically large language models like chat GPT. And even his study finds even those models have some of the properties of general purpose technologies. So if you you're, you started by asking what is the connection to business? And I think my answer is it is going to be fundamentally transformative for business. Then you're talking about basically kind of like a pivot moment. Uh, you know, we use the term pivot a lot over the last three or four years because of the pandemic and how businesses had to make pivots in order to be able to survive. This is a pivot, but on a much larger scale of where we are going uh, as a society. Absolutely. I mean, you've just brought up the pandemic. Imagine with the pandemic, without the internet, what that pandemic would be like. You know, we were able to navigate the pandemic because of the internet. We were able to continue to work because of Zoom and other things. So the internet was really a general purpose technology that has changed our lives and it had a huge impact over the last 20 years and certainly the last two, three years. AI will be similar as well. I mean, we're just starting to see the early, you know, things like chat GPT, but this is just the start. I mean, it's going to change everything and companies that don't wake up to that reality, that want to follow rather than lead, that want to uh, say, look, you know, this could be just a next buzzword. We will play it safe. Or the companies that say, you know, the moment they see an early failure that backtrack and say there's no ROI on this. Like the companies that did do that when the dot-com bust happened. Companies that play these kinds of moves will pay a big price. And I think it's the companies that truly embrace its potential and play the long game. They're going to be the big winners from, from this trend. So then what do you say about some of the recent calls to maybe slow down the development process and maybe take a little bit more time and, and, and really think this out? Because it seems like there are obviously, with some of the people that have talked about this, they have some concerns about how fast things are moving. I think, that, first of all, the concerns are legitimate. Uh, it is moving very fast. This is a technology that is unlike other technologies we've seen in terms of the rate of change and the rate of progress. And especially given its implications for simple things like employment, employability, all the way to, you know, things like use of AI in warfare, or AI going out of control. There's a range of concerns here. So I think the concerns are real. Now, what is the right solution to those? I'm not yet sold on whether a six month pause in AI work is going to change anything. If, first of all, I don't even think it's feasible, but let's say it's feasible and you're able to stop all people working on these kinds of AI models and say, stop for six months. What's going to happen in six months? Nothing. Uh, because it's not like you'll find the magic uh, solution. In fact, right. what needs to happen is, you know, investments in education at school levels, 
where people are trained to understand AI, they're trained to understand things like deep fakes, they're trained to understand issues around ethics when building technology. This is not something you solve in six months, this is something you solve over 10 years and, and change curriculum. You need to retrain engineers, you need to retrain managers, you need to also retrain your congressmen and senators and all of the politicians and lawmakers you can, none of that so what what are you going to change in six months nothing right. and so i think what it requires is like really a focused effort where you're changing things over a 20-year period and you are fast to react to problems that you've noticed with ai i, I would way, yeah go ahead i was gonna say because i i think there's also another issue to bring up here as well and and I'll use ChatGPT as the example because seemingly that is the one that everybody is talking about right now and everybody wants to incorporate in their operations, whether it's Microsoft, Google, companies, et cetera. Uh, how are companies going to be able to use this technology and say be better than their competition if they're all using the same type of product? Yeah. Great question, by the way. I actually think that a lot of the companies that will use off the shelf tools like say ChatGPT and others will create amazing efficiencies that will be copied by a lot of their competitors, which will bring costs down and all of the value I think will accrue to the eventual customers and users because it'll bring prices down. The second thing that's going to happen is because they bring prices down, it will help expand markets because it'll bring in new customers into various markets. And the expansion of markets will mean there's value created for all of those companies equally, meaning all of them gain some. The companies that actually will be able to use things like this to get a real advantage over their competitors are going to be companies that are able to pair off-the-shelf AI tools and capabilities with something proprietary. And what is that proprietary complementary asset they can bring to the table is going to be the name of the game for companies that are aggressively investing. So I'll give you a couple examples of what is a proprietary thing they can bring in. You could use an off-the-shelf large language model like GPT-4, which is basically the underlying model for uh, you know, the chat GPT, which was like GPT 3.5, but you can use an off the shelf model like that. But if you've got a large proprietary data set of say healthcare information, healthcare data set, you can train or retrain those models on your massive healthcare data set. And now you've created a new AI that is the best in class at answering healthcare questions. And you were able to do that because you had the largest proprietary healthcare data set. You could do the same thing in finance and other areas. So that's one. You bring in something proprietary, usually a very large proprietary data set. Or you change something in terms of user experience. A good example of ChatGPT itself, OpenAI, the company be, uh, behind ChatGPT, has had GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3 for a while and developers have been using it. The capability in chat GPT is not fundamentally new. It was already there and we've seen it. I've used GPT-3 for over a year now. The difference is chat GPT provided that in a very seamless, easy to use um, sort of UI. And that shows you the value of user experience. So somebody can take off the shelf AI, but integrate it into a great user experience that creates a winning combination. Or somebody co combines, like for example, there are companies that are trying to build image editing AI, where you're taking an image and you want to edit it, you want some things to be changed, you don't want to go to Photoshop and do it, and you just want to give an instruction to AI and it does it for you, great. Right. There are lots of startups doing that. Many will use the same kinds of AI, they look very similar. Now, but if an Apple does it, and integrates it into an iPhone, they can give a seamless experience to the user because you don't have to download an app. You can take a photo right there, you can make edits. If Google does it and integrates it into Android, that again gives a seamless experience on the phone. 
that gives them a leg up over anyone else that's using the same kind of ai as them so that so it's all about pairing it with something co- uh, proprietary that is also complementary let me have you discuss the uh, the legal side uh, of the advancements that we're seeing around ai and obviously there's lots of discussion right now uh, around big tech uh, on the regulatory side at the moment how then does ai factor into the discussions on, on legal and IP issues? Yeah, I mean, there's there's tons of legal issues around AI. I'll, I think I'll mention a couple one, a couple ones. One is, is what happens when you use AI to make decisions in socially consequential settings and you do it at large scale. So for example, there have been concerns about using AI in courtrooms, for example, to predict the likelihood that a, defend, a defendant will reoffend, or what happens if you use AI to do resume screening, or you use AI to do loan approvals, and it turns out these AI have biases, then a company that uses them in these very important settings exposes themselves to uh, you know, litigation and those kinds of yeah. issues. And so that's one type of issue. And I think at the end of the day, my view on this is, look, yes, you can complain all day you want about potential biases in AI. But before we do that, let's talk about what's the alternative. The alternative is humans, fundamentally flawed human decision makers who have their own biases. So it's not like decisions in courtroom today or in hiring today are unbiased and you're switching to AI that's more biased. In fact, the reality is AI biases are probably easier to detect than human biases and probably easier to correct than AI biases. And so companies will have to make sure they're taking sufficient safeguards, auditing their AI sufficiently uh, before they release AI in these socially consequential settings. So that's one set of concerns. The other related to generative AI And we already saw this play out last weekend when this uh, track was released that was supposed to be by Drake. Uh, It did really well, took off, and then it turns out somebody created it with AI. And so I think the legal issues there are going to be both on the input side of generative AI and the output side. And by input side, I mean what kind of data are used to train the AI. So if you're using data to train AI to create music, The question is, where did that training data set come from? Do you have the consent of the musicians who's created the music before you trained your system on that? Are you giving them suitable compensation? If money is made out of the resulting product, how are you tracking what is each musician's contribution? You create a new, brand new song. How do you say 2% of the song is inspired from Jay-Z and 3% from Drake and 4% from somebody else. How do you even determine that? That's on the input side. And on the output side, if you create a new track and in Drake's voice uh, or in Elvis's voice, is that allowed? Do you need permissions? Do you, you know, so there's all these kinds of things. And by the way, US copyright law doesn't even cover synthetic media. So what is the copyright law around creation of content by AI. So lots of issues that have to be tackled in in the coming years. And those are the kinds of things where I think lawmakers and lawyers in general will be slow and not progressive. And they will typically just resort to lawsuits. And I think we'll see a lot of lawsuits in the next two, three years. Can can I have you finish up uh, our conversation around AI and the labor market, because that, I think, is also just uh, the potential fascinating. I mean, obviously, there have been stories and themes thrown out there for quite some time about the potential impact, but we haven't gotten to the point, I think, yet where we've really had the rubber meet the road to a degree. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. true. Uh, Look, I think as far as AI's impact on labor market, anyone who's concerned about its potential impact on the labor market is I think in the you know is asking the right set of questions in the sense that even though technology is in the past in human history 
have often had labor concerns associated with those technologies. Labor is always for technologies. And in the past, it's almost always been the case that new technologies have created more jobs than they have destroyed. And so all of those concerns were misplaced in the past. The real question is, is AI like every other technology in the past where it will eventually create more jobs than it destroys? Or is it going to ultimately uh, be a net job, you know, cannibalizer as opposed to creator? And I think that's the big question. We don't know the answer. If you were to put a gun to my head and say, give me an answer right now, Karthik, I would say, well, I think it's probably going to have a net job loss rather than that job creation. However, yeah. that is not the full answer though. Because AI will also augment jobs and not just merely replace jobs. So there will be a lot of jobs where there's a lot of routine things that we do that we don't enjoy, that we do repetitively, that are you know soul sucking in some ways we will be able to outsource that to AI and we'll free up time to do the more interesting, more creative pieces of the job, which I think will be great for all of us. So I think, you know, there's going to be that as well. And I also want to distinguish between high skill and low skill jobs. So the kind of AI that's been around for the last 10 years, we'll call it predictive AI. These are, this is AI that makes predictions and you plug it into different tasks like predict if a credit card transaction is fraudulent or not, predict if an email is spam or not, or things like that. This kind of AI, you know, is one type. And then there's generative AI, which is like chat GPT or, uh, you know, stable diffusion that's creating text, that's creating images and so on. And I want to talk about how these impact jobs at different skill levels. But first thing I'm going to just say is, Historically, automation has affected blue collar jobs the most. Low skill jobs, that's what it's automated uh, and affected the most. The question is, is this true for the new kinds of AI like chat GPT or image creation? And early research actually suggests that, it suggests two things. One is that these new kinds of AI increase productivity for workers. So there's a test that's been done on developers, a research study focused on developers using code generation AI. There's a research study that was focused on chat GPT like system to improve writing. And all of these show like nearly a twofold increase in productivity with just these early forms of AI and over time much greater productivity. But what these studies show is also that not all workers benefit equally. The study with developers showed that developers with the lowest skill levels benefited much more than developers with high skill levels. The study with writing showed that writers who had the lowest writing skills benefited more so than writers uh, with the highest skills. So one of the things it also sh sh shows is that the new kinds of AI will affect white collar jobs for sure but they will also empower workers with lower skill levels and help create an equal playing field. Um, and by the way, you know, in, in global commerce today, English, just knowing English is, you know, the path to a job, it's a path to success. And somebody who doesn't know English, it's, you could have very high intelligence, very high skill, but not knowing English could itself yeah. be the bottleneck. You suddenly bring generative AI, and you even the playing field for, for them. And you can apply this for developers. You can apply this for many other workers. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.